Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hope you're all having an amazing day. We have, quite frankly, a ridiculous amount of news to get through in this particular video. But the first thing I'd really like to start out with is an update to the performance of the Threadripper 3990X. Amy covered some benchmarks yesterday, but as we are drawing closer to the official release of these processes, well, we start to get a really good indicator of just how ridiculous they are. The 3990X is not going to be cheap. It's going to be around 4000 US dollars, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, some retailers putting some gouging onto those prices. But anyway, as I said, it's going to launch on the 7th of February, and with 64 cores, 128 threads, you can imagine the performance is going to be pretty impressive. And you would be right, um, some new benchmarks for Geekbench 5 have actually been discovered by Tim Episac, and the too long didn't read here is that the performance absolutely trounces everything, and that's not uh, exaggeration on my part, this is something that easily outperforms all of the other third generation of thread repair parts, let alone the first or second generation, beats every single Intel HEDT processor or server processor, so that would be Xeons and so on. And the thing, the thing that's absolutely crazy is because the clock frequency runs faster on Threadripper, despite the fact that it is losing out uh, on memory channels, it's only got half the memory channels compared to the 7742 Epic 64-core processor, it still actually outperforms it in Geekbench. Now, obviously, your mileage will vary and it will depend heavily on workload. So, if you are doing a lot of VM work and you're really kind of hammering things in terms of memory bandwidth, then obviously extra memory channels of the Epic processors will definitely be handy. But if you're doing content creation and stuff like that, like let's say 3D rendering work, I suspect that this processor is about the fastest CPU that you will be able to purchase for some time. And actually, while I'm on the subject of uh, content creation servers and stuff like that, and also given I'm talking about AMD, I'd like to shift the discussion to VMware, as there's a very interesting change in their policy. So if you're unfamiliar with this company, they specialize in products for virtualization and those type of environments. And there's a good chance that if you've used the internet, inadvertently you would have used a website or a service which would be contingent on running under VMware. So there has been a trend in the industry that core counts in terms of CPUs go up. And while obviously we as end consumers think of that as performance, it also has other tangible benefits. Basically more cores in a smaller space, so data centers and they need to worry about physical size and also things like power consumption because, as you can imagine, power consumption is a really big thing with data centers as well as heat output and lots of other stuff. And I am kind of simplifying this, of course, for the sake of brevity. But long story short, uh, VMware are actually changing the way that their licenses work. So currently, they work as kind of like a CPU license. So in short, no matter no, the, no matter the number of cores, you basically are covered with that license because it's on a one CPU. Now, obviously, if you have more CPUs, that's different. But the one physical CPU works on a single license. But you can see yourself here, the change. So if a processor now has 32 cores or fewer, you will only need a single license. But if you have more than 32 cores, let's say 64, as in the case of the 7742, for example, you will actually need to purchase two of these licenses, which will drastically increase the price of, uh, in terms of software. So this is obviously kind of a kick in the shin to AMD in the short term, but it will also affect Intel as well when we see their next generation server processors leak out. I mean, oh sorry, release, excuse me. From what we understand, they're definitely going to be going more than uh, than 32 cores. 
So it's going to definitely impact Intel. In fact, in a way, it may impact Intel more because at least with AMD, you get 64 cores for your license. But with Intel, the uh, number of cores for Ice Lake is only going to be uh, 38 cores, assuming the bloody product ever gets released, of course, which is an entirely separate discussion. So why are they doing this? Well, I don't think it's got anything to do with outside influences like Intel. I do know that that is a popular conspiracy theory that's kind of going around right now, that Intel have been kind of nudging them to increase this because of the competitiveness of, of uh, Rome. But I don't think it is. My personal opinion is it's just that they don't want to lose money. Basically speaking... With ROM, you are literally doubling the number of processor cores compared to the first generation Epic CPUs. So it's kind of like, in their perspective, well, if data centers are doing this, there's a good p potential that we're going to be losing money. So what they've basically done is now make it so that if you have more than 32 cores, you will need to procure a separate license, which also means that the... 48 core epic processors from AMD for example are also going to be a lot less palatable. The one good piece of news out of this, and I'm going to read this verbatim, the vast majority of the currently installed base of the VM software is deployed on existing Intel and AMD base servers that are at or below the 32 core threshold. Any existing customers who purchase the VMware software licenses to be deployed on a physical server with no, with more than, excuse me, 32 cores per CPU prior to April 30th, 2020, will be eligible for an additional free per CPU license to cover the CPUs on that server. So at least there's some light at the end of the tunnel, but once again, that will only be applicable um, up until the 30th of April. The final related piece of news anyway, is that we have an update concerning the Z490 motherboards for uh, Intel, but we also have some B550 motherboards which have also been spotted on uh, the EEC website. Uh, full credit, by the way, to videocards.com. That will be linked in the video description. Um, so the B550 motherboards in particular have been kind of interesting because... There was a B550A chipset which was designed specifically for OEMs and in the words of AMD's Robert Halleck, it has a B550A motherboard. This is a version of the PCIe Gen 3 Pro Monterey chipset, i.e. basically it's a B550, uh, B450, excuse me, specifically for use on pre-built systems. OEMs are customers too and they have different needs and wants compared to a DIYer. Not every product decision is considered through the lens of a channel product, end quote. But we have been waiting for the B550 motherboards with the non-A um, at the end of it. So the B550s are basically, I guess the best way of describing them is X570, albeit without crossfire slash SLI support. And quite frankly, it feels like we've been waiting forever for them, given that the first Ryzen 3000 series CPUs launched back in July. So what we do get, of course, is PCIe 4, which means that if you only want to plonk in a graphics card and you have basic storage needs, so let's say you want one M2 drive, maybe a couple of SATA drives or something like that, which kind of works well for most gamers, to be totally honest with you, the B550 board would be pretty damn nice. So Gigabyte now have six B550 Aorus motherboards that have been uh, that have passed, excuse me, certification. And we also, on the same subject, know that the Z490 boards are going to be coming as well. So we actually have a ridiculous number of uh, Intel. Z490 boards which have also passed certification. These of course are going to be for the LGA1200 chipset which will be for Comet Lake. It's kind of ridiculous to be honest just how long as I said we have been waiting for B550 and uh, yeah it just kind of feels like at this point it's almost running a little bit late. The one thing you can say though is that graphics cards don't really take advantage yet of PCIe Gen 4 but the same cannot be said necessarily for storage devices. And as the year progresses, 
uh, Gen 4 devices will certainly become more normal on store shelves. And now, shifting to console-related news, the PlayStation 5 is coming. The official website for the PlayStation 5 has actually launched now, and it doesn't really give that much information. In fact, I'll read the quote out to you. We've begun to share some of the incredible features you can expect from the PlayStation 5, but we're not quite ready to fully unveil the next generation PlayStation. Sign up below to be amongst the first to receive updates as we announce them, including news on the PS5 release date, price, and the upcoming roster of PS5 launch games. So it doesn't look like we're going to get any type of official reveal in February. It looks like it's going to be later on in the year. And I think there are several reasons behind that. One of which is basically that the PlayStation 4 is still going quite strong. And probably Sony doesn't want to muddy the water in terms of the games as well that are coming out exclusive to the PlayStation. Like, for example, Final Fantasy VII uh, Remake is coming out. So they probably still want to put a lot of focus on that for now. But another reason is definitely they're waiting to see what Xbox is going to bring to the table. Indeed, there is an interesting article doing the rounds on IGN where the chief financial officer over at Sony was explaining that while they do want a smooth transition from the PS4 to PS5, they still have some issues in that they don't know what the price level is going to be for the next generation consoles. I'm going to read out a uh, translation verbatim, if that made any sense. What is not very clear or visible is because we are trying to compete in the space, so it's very difficult to discuss anything about the price at this point in time. And depending on the price level, we may need to determine the promotion we are going to deploy and how much cost we're prepared to pay. In other words, what they need to figure out right now is what Microsoft are going to be charging for the Xbox Series X and what Microsoft are going to do to promote the console in terms of bundles, Are they going to, for example, provide six months of Game Pass for the Xbox? Which would honestly be a quite simple way for Microsoft to provide gamers, well, games, but also not at a ridiculous price to them. And naturally, if Microsoft are willing to eat some of the cost of the console, the Xbox Series X, because they may decide to sell the console at either a break-even point or they may decide to sell the console at a loss. The original Xbox, which was released back in the day, of course, Microsoft actually were losing money per console, but did so to simply try and get their foot in the door of the console market. And we know that the original Xbox did pretty well, but it was really the Xbox 360 which kind of solidified Microsoft into the console space. And I think next generation of consoles is going to be pretty brutal Um, in terms of the competition, I think that Microsoft get their butts handed to them in the last generation. I would say that Phil Spencer, when he took over, he did a really good job of kind of bringing Microsoft back, but Don Matrick and his team were just not fans of gaming, to be honest with you, and it really shown with the Xbox One. But since then, Microsoft have done a pretty fantastic job in being more competitive, And there's actually another interesting article that's doing rounds uh, regarding the Xbox before we'll get into the actual um, Xbox's own official website. Yes, we now have the Xbox Series X official website. But um, according to Brad Sams over at Forret.com, he believes that we will essentially have uh, expandable storage thanks to a CF Express card at the rear of the Xbox. Now, do take into consideration that this may not make it into the final product, but according to him anyway, um, the the mysterious slot that we saw at the rear of the prototype Xbox Series X is indeed going to be um, for the CF Express Type B memory card, and the expansion port measures 31 mm by 4 mm in size and the thing is about these particular solid state uh expansion cards they're not cheap they're not like what you would pay to put in like the nintendo switch for example um you could spend like a couple of hundred bucks and get a card which is just 
pretty titchy when you think about it. It's like 128 gigabytes. So I'm going to be really curious to see how Microsoft are going to kind of square that circle. Because you can check the prices yourself. It's going to cost you several hundred US dollars for just half a terabyte. So 512 gigabytes is roughly around the 600 US dollar mark. That's not cheap for storage. Um... So I'm going to be really interested to see how all of this comes together in terms of storage for the next generation consoles. Because what we do know, of course, is both Sony and Microsoft have put a paramount importance on the SSDs. And I'm not going to go through all the benefits of how an SSD functions in this video. I've discussed it like a billion times before. But at the end of the day, consoles will need... Um, an SSD which is going to be comparable so I kind of wonder how SSDs are going to work in terms of expanding the storage do we have a slower mechanical drive on the consoles for example which will act as the mass storage and then the SSD is almost like a cache slash works with games which are current or is it going to be ex expandable somehow or another and if so how would that work in terms of certification will you need I, I don't know how else to describe it, but would it be a bit like the memory cards back in the days of, like, let's say the PlayStation 2, where you can't just use, like, you know, anything. You can't just use some random USB thumb drive that you've got lying around. You obviously need a specific device to be able to save it. It's going to be really interesting to see how that functions. And quite honestly, I would like to see what the difference is between Sony's approach and Microsoft's approach for the next generation, or whether they're both going to implement a very similar method. And as I mentioned, the Xbox Series X has its own website now, which is functioning anyway. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.